Hi, welcome to Uncommon Visionaries Go-To-Market Sessions, a series where we explore the latest trends and challenges facing go-to-market leaders and how to take them on. I'm Linda Leanne, the co-founder and CEO of Common Room, the leading community growth platform. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by Lee Robinson, the VP of Developer Experience at Vercel. It's a pleasure having you, Lee. Can you introduce yourself and Vercel to our audience? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to be here and chat. Uh, yeah, I'm Lee. I lead our developer experience organization at Vercel, uh, which includes both DevRel and documentation. And uh, Vercel is a, a platform for front-end developers. We basically try to make it easy as possible to write some code and get it online. Fantastic. Well, let's dive right into it. I think DevRel has historically been somewhat of a amorphous title. Um, but what's consistent is that it always has been a customer facing, community facing, developer facing discipline. So when you started in DevRel at Vercel, what was your role? How did you get into it? And how did you make an impact? Yeah, I'd say I had a uh, non-traditional start into DevRel. I had been doing more of the traditional DevRel work in terms of content creation, growing a community prior to joining Vercel. But when I joined Vercel, we were really small, just like I was, you know, a 30 person company, um, you know, had really good product market fit, but we're just starting to kind of expand the levers on the kind of enterprise go to market side. So for me coming in at the time, we were launching our first ever conference, uh, first Next.js Conf. And the immediate need at the time was we need more people to help actually get this thing out the door and to actually ramp up the GDM side of our business um, who understand our product, understand our community and can kind of sell the vision of where we're headed. So <laughs> it was kind of a it was kind of a strange pitch at first because it was like you're going to do DevRel. But what we need right now is we need engineers who understand our community and understand our product. And I'm like, okay, perfect. I can do that. I, I can I can solve that need um, because I was, you know, optimistic about the company in the the long term, but also the short term. The short term path sounded interesting as well too. So I started kind of more in a sales engineer, solutions engineer type role, helping out with both. I mean, it was kind of both pre and post sales at the time because we were pretty small. And I learned a lot <laughs> because it was uh, different, I think, than how a lot of DevRel uh, functions work at other companies. And that's shaped, I think, a lot of how we view DevRel today. How do you guys view DevRel today? So you started in solution engineering, really enabling you know developers to get onto uh, Vercel and I assume you know Next.js as a framework. Um, you're touching customers all along the customer journey, from developers who are just getting started to you know your customers. How has that kind of um, evolved over time as you've grown this function and led it? I mean, it's incredible to think that you joined during the first Next.js conference, because I think this year it was bigger and better than ever, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was really, I mean, it, it started off, you know, virtual only in, in 2020. And, uh, you know, we, we still had a pretty good turnout for the first event, but it's just got bigger and bigger every year since this year, having the first hybrid event. Um, I think it this experience has really shaped how we run DevRel today. I think the biggest takeaway for me is that your community is also your customers. And I think sometimes there are, there are some DevRel folks who maybe that feels a little dirty because you think I'm building this community and it's this thing and I don't want to tamper like trying to sell these people anything. And the, the, the framing of being more involved in the go-to-market side for me that was really helpful was like, I actually feel like we're failing if the people in the community aren't also part of our customer base. Like the people who are using our stuff, they should want to give us money. If they're not, the, the incentives aren't really aligned. And, you know, we're talking specifically about Vercel in this instance and not necessarily like open source stuff. Um, so that framing was, was very helpful for me 
uh, in terms of like how I interacted with the, with the community and how I talked to our customers, right? Because these community building events, not only were they good to build the relationships, but also they were an opportunity to say, hey, I know you're using our product. I know you're a customer as well as a community member. What, what isn't good? Like you use the stuff, you pay a, a monthly price to use our, our product. I want to hear everything about it. I want to know what's good and what's not good. Yeah, absolutely. I think what you're calling out is this incredible power for developer experience to not only you know activate that flywheel of product activation, which then leads to obviously revenue and customers, but also that feedback loop between the community and the end users and developers and ultimately building a better product roadmap. And I've always seen those two pillars being both like customer community facing and then also, you know, really that feedback cycle to product as being two of the biggest levers and pillars of great developer experience teams. Um, so what does community mean to you and to Vercel as a business and as you know a community? I mean, you guys have almost 100,000 stars on GitHub, the last Next.js conference of you know, tens of thousands of attendees. You have 200,000 followers across Next.js and Vercel Twitter handles. I mean, what does all of that mean to you? Yeah, when when people ask me what my job is, I basically say my sole my sole role is essentially growing and educating our community. Like that's that's pretty much what it all boils down to. So when I think about our community, I think about this group of developers who really really love the front end. And yes, there's going to be people who, you know, are very experienced with the back end and like to build APIs or like to work with databases and all this other stuff. But really the, the core folks who love Vercel are the people who are just in, incredibly passionate about the front end. And that's the stuff that we, you know, we also love as well, too, and that we geek out about, right? Um, whether that's React or Next.js or uh, SvelteKit or other related frameworks or tools or even just, you know, CSS itself, like all of these things we care so much about. And that's the that's the uh, the orbit, I guess, of people that kind of are interested in our our uh, our community. So when I think about our community, I think about it in one, how do we kind of activate and grow those people and add more folks who are interested into the you know products or tools that we're building and two how do we kind of retain or build the relationships of the people who have already decided hey I want to use Vercel I want to deploy here I like these tools I like the people um, I'm going to spend some time on this so on the former on kind of growing the community a lot of this comes down to more traditional DevRel slash marketing type work, right? We want to you want to do some events. We want to do content creation. We want to do outreach. All of this kind of bubbles up into just putting people into the top of that funnel and getting them into the community. Uh, on the the ladder of actually engaging and growing that, to me, the number one thing to do here is actually being best friends with our customer success or support functions of our business. Because at the end of the day, the, the, the developer experience, at least in our instance of a platform for developers is if I'm having a bad time and I can't get anybody to really assist me or give me feedback on what's going wrong, then I don't really feel like they're on my side. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, all we're going to do all day is just sit and listen for people to have an issue and just like all we do is support. It's mostly automating ourselves out of making that process as seamless as possible. So it's not just, hey, my build failed, like what's wrong? It's okay, let's dig a lot deeper. Why did your build fail? And this is like, this is the insight I think that DevX can bring. It's like, why did your build fail? Well, actually it was because we were missing this specific component in our Next.js application, for example. So then we kind of bring that extra layer of introspection where it's like, okay, how did you even get into this state? And what checks and balances were we missing in the product that would have made this a, a non-issue? And then we can solve it by either giving this feedback to the product team and saying, hey, we have a big deficiency on this side of the house where, you know, we're seeing this pattern of people in our community who just 
keep falling into this bad place and we need to have better guardrails on the product side. Or it's content that we create or content that we work with on the you know, customer success side or the documentation side to have links for when people run into these problems and guide them into the right place. And you can kind of automate this a little bit with really helpful error messages, right? So it's not perfect, but maybe the next time somebody runs into this exact same situation, they get an error and that error has a URL and that URL gives them to, you know, some docs page that we have that explains the situation they're probably in. And that essentially unblocks them from needing to contact us directly and get, you know, one-on-one -on -one human support. Yeah. I mean, I think there's so much that you just touched on from, you know, I think some in some organizations, DevRel or DevX can be quite siloed from the rest of the customer facing organization. So, for example, they're not really interfacing with marketing or they don't have a clear mandate to assist, you know, users all the way through the journey into things like customer success. I think the other thing you t and, you know, it's obviously something that you and Vercel have done really well. I think the other thing that's super interesting to call out is what you referred to as, you know, unblocking developers from, you know, kind of enabling them to figure out the answers themselves and not having to talk to somebody and, you know, getting those answers faster, um, being able to surface those avenues to get their answers in product. That's kind of the essence of, you know, the concept of product led growth. And so you guys are very much kind of in that um, enablement channel as well. So it's, uh, it's really amazing. Yeah, I, I think um, one thing that we do maybe unconventionally than, than others in how the developer experience organization and our, our DevRel function is structured is we have a, well, first off, we have a business that is centered around the developer. We don't succeed unless the developer succeeds, right? So we have strong uh, intrinsic alignment there, right? But then we also have, you know, developer experience as part of our executive team as a critical part of the business. And I think our organization kind of plays this role that intentionally spans and is partners to the rest of the business. Sometimes I jokingly call our org as like the quality assurance um, oh, I love like that. <laughs> traffic cop. Yeah. It's not to say that we're like, you know, going to go on every single PR and test everything like a like a more traditional like software engineer and test type thing. It's mostly like, hey, we're about to do this big launch. Have we thought about every aspect of this from end to end? Not just the product side, not just the marketing side, not just the GTM side. Like what happens on this big launch on this big day when I go to the blog post and I click deploy? Like have, have we thought about every piece of that funnel all the way down to like that really weird pricing change that needs to happen that you might not have considered because you were so focused on just building the thing. And it's like, that's the, that's the tricky stuff is you reach scale. You have all of these different parts of the business all doing their own things independently. And, you know, they can all be functioning very, very well. It's just thinking about that whole thing holistically is where sometimes you start to see that's where the cracks open up. So I, I sometimes I think of us like that as like this quality assurance across making sure you, you know, you download the app and it works. I love that. I mean, it's really about whenever a developer engages with Vercel, right? Whether they're just kicking the tires or early in their solution discovery, or they're one of your most important customers, you want every single touch point to be like an incredible experience to, and to have that quality. So let's talk about operationalizing all of this. <laughs> um, you know, I think a lot of folks want what you guys have built. They want this sort of incredible sort of developer experience team that spans every single touch point across the customer journey. But how do you, from an internal tools or operations perspective, really get that connectedness, right? I think five years ago, right, like you would say, hey, the work that I do as a DevRel leader, it's not really that data that those customer touch points, they're not really being integrated into our go to market tooling stack. They're not really being integrated into my business from a data perspective. And so how have you guys kind of grappled with that? Yeah, I think there's there's two larger themes here. Um, the first one um, 
<laughs> it sounds silly, but like truly just being customer accessed. I know that that's, you know, maybe overused, but it really is. I feel like one of the biggest differentiators, um, basically all I do is just sweat the details of how our customers are using our product and whether they're having a good time end to end. The second is like, that can be very, um, like very micro focused on, you know, just, just the people you talk to, right? How do you zoom out and look at the macro of thousands and thousands of developers across our entire platform, right? I can't go talk to them all, even though I would love to, right? And to do that, you have to, you have to bring the data. You have to be data driven to understand the trends and especially over time as well, too. Um, so part of that stems from, I think, um, your organization at large having a good understanding of which metrics are very important for, I, I guess, the overall health of your company, but also the ones that DevX or your DevRel function should really focus in on. And for example, two of the ones that we really care a lot about are our monthly active developers and our monthly active domains. If, if things are going well, those two things should be going up and to the right. And an interesting nuance that the DevRel, DevX side can kind of bring into that is let's segment that by the specific products that we talk to customers a lot about. And we have a, um, um, you know, this would be different depending on the company, but kind of the slice that we have is also by framework as well too, right? So for example, we might say, um, you know, we see that the monthly active developers of Next.js is rising by X and they're using these products. Why are they not using this product in particular? Do we have a deficiency in how we talk about it? Do we have a deficiency in, is it actually just not a good product, right? And then you can kind of take that macro level understanding of the world and see if it matches up, matches up with your assumptions of the micro level of like, well, yeah, I talked to this customer yesterday and they said that this was really, really hard and kind of bridging those two things together. Um, I will say, you know, we don't have it perfect. There's definitely ways that we can better automate parts of this. There's definitely ways that we can get even more fine grained insights. But I think as long as we keep it focused on kind of those two goals, be customer obsessed, and then, you know, don't forget about the data, it, it really goes a long way. I think when I, when I talk to customers, what I hear the most is they care that we really care about their experience and they really respect when we listen and then we ship the thing. And I think this is like, this is like the lifeblood of a small startup. When you, we've only got five people, six people, you listen to your small number of customers, right? They say, hey, I wish we had this thing. You kind of mull over it for a little bit and then you build the thing and then you tell them that you shipped it. But somewhere between five and 500, a lot of companies forget like, hey, we still have to talk to those people, even though we now have a bunch more customers, they still want to see this same velocity. And that's why like the product that we sell, helping developers iterate faster, we have to do the same thing internally too. If we're not iterating fast and then telling our customers about how fast we're iterating, then how can you believe us that Vercel is helping you iterate fast? So, which, it, which makes a ton of sense, right? So a customer will come to me and say, you know, I can't figure out how to combine um, Next.js and ChatGPT topical. And I'm like, good news. We just built a demo last night. Here's a URL. You can clone and deploy it in 60 seconds. And like that iteration speed of like, they had an idea. We had a solution. We productionized it and turned it into a template that people can clone and deploy and get started that shows the speed of our platform. To actually put a tangible example of this, just again, topical is, um, you know, a developer on my team, Steven, and then another developer, um, Dom, at our company, they were like, wow, this chat GPT thing is awesome. It'd be cool if I could share the results and then get a Next.js and Vercel website that had the, you know, outputted text so I can send to my friends. And they're like, this is a sweet idea. We should build this. So they build it and ship it within 24 hours, and then it gets featured on TechCrunch. And it's like, that's that's the iteration speed that we're trying to sell developers on. If we're not living by it, if the DevX team isn't doing the same thing, then how can people trust us that, to buy that thing? So we have to we have to also ship. <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds like there's a, just a big focus on 
being customer obsessed and aligning the vision and how you build and everything that Vercel is about to honestly the vision and mission of enabling what your developers and your front end developers care about, right? Like if they're the types that are looking for innovation and fast iteration, you have to live that as well internally. Um, I love that. So what about getting credit? <laughs> So you join Vercel, you're doing all these things, right? You're customer facing, you're helping people adopt the tooling, you're, you know, now you own documentation and all um, a much bigger scope. How do you get credit for that? Because with marketing and with sales, you know, there's been a playbook, there's a practice, there's a, a way in which, you know, sellers are going to get credit for the work that they're doing. How do you think about that with DevX? Yeah, I think um, my role has to be very selfless because most of the time, the stuff that I'm advocating for is stuff that I didn't build. Um, you know, it's like, hey, Vercel just launched this new thing. It's amazing. And it was built by this amazing team, right? They deserve the credit for this thing. I did not write the code for it. Maybe I wrote the blog post for it, or maybe I like built a little example for it, but it would not happen without the innovation of like this amazing engineer, for example, right? So we have to be selfless in that way while also still understanding where do we provide the step change in improvement to Vercel, which is like, what can we do that nobody else can do? Or what can we do better than, than others, right? And that's that intersection of all of these different fields. It's like, yes, we didn't build the thing, but we were able to dissect and understand the thing and then make a video explaining the thing and then mobilize that and take it to the entire community and bring it along for the ride and teach them about the thing. And that's the, the uniquely positioned value that we provide. Um, so I think on one hand, that, that kind of leads more, I guess, to like the content side of it and how you can be, yeah. you know, uh, like at I scale, guess. what about like one-to-one -one interactions? Like I am confident we've talked about this before where, you know, you've personally impacted the success of many of her sales, let's call it like enterprise customers, right? What about those moments? How do you think about something like credit? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would say one thing that our, our company culture does well is we, we appreciate and we reward not only helping out the, you know, the customers or community building their hobby site, building their portfolio on Vercel, unblocking them, helping them succeed. But also when, you know, myself or someone on my team goes and gives a presentation for, you know, big co company on enterprise, they go, you know, fly to their headquarters and give a presentation for all of their engineering team, right? That's helping unblock or expand that line of business inside of Vercel too, which is also, you know, arguably the, the same level of importance or more importance because that's the lifeblood of, of what makes Vercel's business grow. I think this, that's actually a really another good point to touch on is the um, one thing I'm, I'm very fortunate in getting a lot of experience with at Vercel and being both on the GTM side as well as the just more general decoupled entire company side with DevX now is uh, seeing how the sausage is made per se. And, and I guess what I mean by that is like a lot of folks who are involved in open source maybe don't realize like this isn't just for free. There has to be some kind of business behind this that allows us to keep the lights on and give away this open source software to make everything run. So it's better to be transparent and honest about that, how that happens so that people understand where the incentives are aligned. So that's why I tell people like, yeah, we might go speak in an internal conference for a large enterprise customer, or we might build an example for a large enterprise customer because they're paying us for our expertise. And by them paying us X number of money, that's how we're able to give away Next.js as an open source tool for companies all over the world to build. And as long as those incentives are very clear, I think it makes it actually, you know, a lot more compelling to want to purchase software from Vercel or to want to use Vercel on the free tier. I think, you know, if we think about even like other, um, other ways that you want to get your, your site hosted online, there's some skepticism, I think, of developers like, is this thing really free? Like, how can they provide this thing for free 
where am I getting swindled? Right. And I think that's why we have to, you know, be very clear when we say like, we make money not only in our, you know, enterprise tier selling to large companies on our self-serve tier where customers can sign up, put in their credit card and pay for us. All of that subsidizes giving away, you know, a, a free tier product that developers can get started, try it out, you know, build some small sites on it, host their portfolio site on it, and then expand if they want into other parts of the business. And as long as that is really clear, then the incentives are aligned with how we value and price our software. Yeah. And I think the flip side of that is if I'm someone who works in DevRel, right, I want to be at an organization where I am making that impact, not only with the community, but ultimately on the business. And again, I think this is where, you know, what you've done and, you know, what you've built is super unique. And I think, um, you know, it, the markets are tough. We're seeing a lot of our uh, uh, DevRel folks, you know, sometimes getting laid off. And I think a lot of times it comes down to not not making that like awareness transition to saying, hey, I'm a core driver of the success of this business, not just like our open source community, but our business as well. Right. And that impact that you can have every day is is really significant when you kind of reorient DevRel and DevX to be a true go-to-market and customer-facing function. It's like, it's it's extremely valuable for, for folks on my team to be able to say, you know, I went and dug deep with these customers. I solved their problems. I helped them expand. And I made these resources to help them succeed. Because of that, this was a, you know, $500,000 deal. And now they're growing and expanding on our platform. And I can attribute some of that success to my investment. That's a, that's a no brainer for me to say, absolutely. Like you deserve every bit of success that you've had, um, because it's such a clear driver back to how our business makes money. So it, I think I, I totally agree that, um, it, you, we can't be too far removed from the, the drivers that keep the lights on essentially. Yeah, and that's also how like customer success functions, sales functions, and marketing functions really start to lean on your org, right? And the and the expertise and sort of the customer love that you guys have. Um, well, Lee, thank you so much for the time today. This has been such an incredible conversation. Um, really appreciate your insights. This is great. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. It's it's always fun to chat about this stuff. It's uh. I appreciate your unique perspective on all this too, because it's a it's a merger of worlds that I like to talk about. <laughs> to hear future conversations with other go to market leaders like Lee, follow Common Room on LinkedIn and Twitter, and find us at commonroom.io.